Hello, I'm Dr Jane McCartney. I'm a chartered psychologist in the UK and fascinated by all things human behaviour wise, but particularly I'm fascinated by crime and those who commit the crimes. In today's episode, I wanted to look at Stephen Port, also known as the Grinder Killer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at his background, I'm going to look at the timeline of the murders that he committed, and then I'm going to look at a personality profile and then offer some analysis at the end. Now remember, this is me just speculating, I'm not diagnosing anybody. Before I start, if I could please ask you to like and subscribe, and if you would like to put some comments below, that'd be really great. It's always interesting to read what people have to say. So Stephen Port was born in Southend-on-Sea in the county of Essex in the UK in 1975. From what I can gather, I can't read it, seem to find a lot about his background, but from what I can gather, he had at least one sister, whether she was older or younger, I'm not too sure. When he was about a year old, his parents would move further into Essex towards London and they would settle in Dagenham. His childhood, from what I can see, was pretty unremarkable. There was some comment about one of his teachers saying that he was, they thought he may have had a, a, a hearing problem because he was very slow to speak or he just didn't talk at, at all in class. Now, this was never, I don't think, diagnosed or looked into, but when it seems to suggest that he was just very potentially slow to to process what was going on but also very childlike and I'm going to come on to that a little bit later. He would have a few menial jobs and he settled on being a chef in a, 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 a company that runs buses and coaches in the UK and he would be the chef for the, the staff. He'd run the kitchens or work in the kitchens for 10 years and seemingly he got on really well there. He enjoyed his job and at one point he appeared on a, a British TV show when they were doing some kind of, I think it was some kind of charity event where they were cooking for the homeless or something and he he, he appeared on that. I'll, I'll put some, some photos in about that. So... All pretty unremarkable, nothing particularly coming out with his, his personality or, or his background or anything. But he would come out as being gay in the year 2000. And his sister actually said that his mum, whether this is true or not, I'm not too sure, but apparently his, his mum had a little bit of a problem with that because she had wanted grandchildren. This is what his sister had said. He moved into his own property when he was 31. And it would seem that then his drug taking, he was a prolific drug taker and he particularly liked the GBH drug. And he was a prolific drug taker and a partier and enjoyed his solo life. He funded it himself by working as the chef. And he would use, as known as the grinder killer, he would use the grinder websites, but he would also be a frequent user of lots of male escort sites. So in 2000 and so in 2014, Port was using a male escort site called Sleepy Boys, and he particularly liked younger boys. And he was 39 at the time, or, or thereabouts. And he would refer to them in his texts that were looked at for evidence and by the police later on. He would refer to them as twinks. This was a well-known term for younger male escorts, and he particularly liked the look of one lad that was on there, Anthony Walgate, who was 23. He invited him to his flat in Barking in Essex, which is not very far from Dagenham, where he was brought up. And they agreed that he would pay £800 for Anthony Walgate to stay overnight with him. Four days later, Anthony Walgate's dead body was found propped up outside Stephen Port's flat. It was by the dustbins outside and seemingly... Port himself had called 999 and it would transpire later that what had happened was he had removed him from his flat he had died in his flat and he had removed him from his flat and placed him there and there was a telltale sign of when he'd pulled him out of the the his flat or the downstairs door or something his jumper had been pulled up or his top had been pulled up and that's an important thing to note because that comes on a little bit later he said he knew nothing about the 
the the person that was found, Anthony Walgate. He, he didn't know him at all. But when the police looked into it, he'd found that he'd met him on the dating site. And ultimately, he would be charged and imprisoned for perverting the course of justice because he had lied about that. But that, at the time, was the only thing seemingly that the police were interested in. A few months later, August, the end of August in 2014, Gabriel Cavari, who, who was a, a young man, and he was living in London, he was enjoying living in London, he was living kind of with, with friends, a bit of sofa surfing, and he was one with one particular friend, and he, I think he felt that he potentially outstayed his welcome with his friend. His friend had not said anything to him, but Gabriel felt he had, and he said, I'll find somewhere to rent myself. And he ended up in Port's flat. Port, Port had put up that he was available, you know, he, he had a, a room to rent or something, but he didn't. And Gabriel would actually say to his friend, the one that he had left, that he had ended up sleeping on the sofa. This was his, his rented accommodation. He'd ended up sleeping on the sofa at Port's fam, um, flat. But also he'd, he'd said about Port not being a very nice man. And his friend was concerned about him and said, please come back. You're more than welcome to come back at any time. Gabriel had kind of assured him that he was OK. And it was the friend that later on would raise concerns because he'd said about Gabriel saying that Port hadn't been a very nice person. At the end of August, so Gabriel had moved in kind of August, beginning August time. And at the end of August, Gabriel's body was found propped up in a graveyard near to Port's flat. A dog walker was on her usual walk, walking through the graveyard, and he, she saw the body of Gabriel. She called the police, of course, they came along, and again, he had that kind of telltale sign of his, his top being pulled up, his, his midriff being exposed. But the police weren't at all suspicious. They just were putting it down to another local escort that had overdosed on drugs. Not even a month later, Port was on the websites again, the escort sites again, and he arranged to meet Daniel Whitworth, who was 24. And on the 20th of September, again, this same dog walker was doing her usual route through the graveyard. And again, she found another dead body of another young man propped up against a gravestone. And again, his, his midriff was being exposed. But this time, when the police investigated, they found a supposedly suicide letter in Daniel's hand saying that he had been the one that had killed Gabriel and couldn't live with the guilt anymore and had killed himself. And the police seemed to take this as was uh, was written. And there was some letter, there was some um, note in the letter as well to say that Gabriel had been with another man, but don't look into him he, he wasn't particularly anything to do with this so again the police just took this as 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 it was written now there were various people various family members various friends of Daniel Gabriel and Anthony who were beginning to put two and two together they were beginning to kind of research about the death of their loved one and then finding the the death of another young man that in just remarkably similar circumstances and they were going to the, the police, the authorities in Barking and Dagenham, and telling them this. But seemingly the police were just being rather dismissive of it. And it was only when the cases were then char um, given to a, a particular crime squad at Scotland Yard, that London's Met, that they were then particularly looked at and they started to, to link these things together. Port... Remember through perverting the course of justice when um, he had lied about Anthony's death, he was jailed for six months in March 2015. He was then released with a tag in June a few months later. And in September of that year, he communicated with Jack Taylor, who was 25 on Grinder, And again, sadly, Jack was to meet the same fate as Gabriel, Daniel and Anthony. And he was found again in the graveyard in a very similar circumstance. It wasn't by the same dog walker this time, but that's where he was found. So he, he 
had lied, Port had lied about knowing him because they were beginning to suspect that he was the, the common denominator in all these things and they interviewed him. He had lied about saying he had nothing to do with him, he knew him, didn't know anything about him. And when they picked up some CCTV, they had seen them walking along a road together. So they knew he was basically the man that they wanted to arrest, interview and potentially charge with the murder of, of Jack, Daniel, Anthony and Gabriel. So he was brought in, he was he duly stood trial and he was found guilty of all four murders and is currently serving a whole life tariff, which means that he will never be released in prison as we speak. So when the police finally arrested Port for the suspicion of these murders and they looked into all of his online activities, they found that he was a huge user of gay porn, but particularly his one particular like was what they call rape porn. So this was when somebody would be drugged and they would be violated in such an awful way. And there was some footage of uh, Port himself with a semi-conscious or unconscious body that he was violating but also there were people with them there was somebody actually taking the footage but also apparently you can hear somebody talking as well if we look at his personality now and then we use the five factor model so when it comes to openness to new experiences yes he scores very highly on that he was interested in drugs and sex and being dominated and domineering he was interested in, in all of those things for his conscientiousness i'd score him quite low um he was goal orientated in what he wanted to do but I think it was just if he it was it was he wasn't planning on things it was just if things would come along so he wasn't particularly determined to to do the things that he did so his score's quite low on that extrovertism he's pretty high because he was out there in lots of clubs and it's interesting that he's the complete opposite to that child that the teachers had the concerns about when he was younger the one that wouldn't even talk but yes he was quite high as an extrovert agreeableness very low I don't think he when it suited him at work he could be agreeable but actually with everything else in his life he doesn't sound a very agreeable person at all and neuroticism I think he was fairly medium with that there was neurotic traits a bit of paranoia about about himself and trying to cover up his crimes and other things that he'd done but he didn't do that very well so that's pr pr probably about a, a medium and it's interesting that they talk about him and one of the things that comes out about him when you look at the research was this this childlike sense this very childishness about him that I seem to pick up on a lot of um, the research and one of the questions could be and apparently one of the things that he would do he would watch kids cartoons and kids tv programs and he would also like to go to toy shops and buy toys for himself that he would then bring home and I think one of the questions that might be asked about that was, was he trying to recreate a, a childlike scenario with the, his victims? You know, they were unconscious or sadly dead. So was he trying to recreate the dominance of a parent and was he trying to create the dominance of a parent and a child? I don't think there is much in that. I think the reason was that he just had childlike activities and childlike things was it, it's almost like because it's a complete opposite to how he was he was this voracious drug user and sexual predator and the other bit of his self could be just this childlike this almost like innocent side of himself that he fed he would feed by going to toy shops and picking up toys it could be argued he was trying to recreate a bit of his childhood. His childhood, from what I can gather, wasn't unhappy. So maybe he was trying to recreate that. Or was it that he was actually trying to create childhood experiences that he felt that he missed out on? I'm not too sure. But there was a certain childlikeness to him, which is the complete opposite. Because when you look at the pictures of him when he was put to trial, even though he was only in his early 40s, he looks so much older. And that could be down to his prolific and long-term drug use, of course. And the one thing that frustrated him more than anything else was the fact that he'd, he'd gone bald quite early and he used to have to wear a toupee, he used to have to wear a wig all the time. And maybe there was some jealousy attached to the fact that he was attracted to the, the younger boys because, you know, most early 20s still have a full head of hair. And maybe that was the attraction to them, that he could just pretend to kind of be the same age as them for just that short time and of course you know when they get back to his flat and they see him taking off his, his wig of course it's going to be horrific to them 
it, not that anything else wouldn't have been about it. Apparently, when he was putting his profile up on Grinder and such similar sites, he would lie. He would say that he'd been in the Navy. He was a special needs teacher. Now, it's not unheard of for people to lie on dating sites, so perhaps we shouldn't read too much into that. There's definitely an element of fantasy, and I think that's one of the things that comes over with Port, that he was a fantasist. And then when the reality of what he was doing, whether he was a, a sexual fantasist or just a fantasist, and when the reality of what he was doing came home to roost, such as he was killing these these young boys, then obviously the... the adultness had to set in and he tried to do something about them not very successfully you know trying but it's interesting that he was probably I wouldn't say encouraged but he certainly wasn't put off by the response of the police of the first three murders that he committed they weren't really taking that much notice so that potentially just enabled him to carry on killing and looking for potential victims as well and other people would come out when his name came up to do with the trial other people would come along and say, no, he, he treated them in, in a similar way. Mercifully, they hadn't been killed, but he would have treated them in the same way. They were drugged, they were unconscious, they would be found, they would wake up or get to consciousness with him violating them in various ways. So this was his MO, this is what he would do to get his domineering and his sexual kicks. And he he largely thought for some time that he he got away with it which for a considerable amount of time he did so those are my thoughts on Stephen Port please put any comments below I'd be really interested to hear and if you could like and subscribe it really helps the channel that'd be really great and until next time thanks ever so much for watching please keep safe and goodbye